Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, good evening. We are returning from executive session and reopening the meeting. Let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> I would like to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded. If any member of the public would like to make an audio or video recording of this meeting, please notify me by raising the hand icon on your screen. And I will notify the public per the Massachusetts public meeting laws. Do we have anyone who is making a recording today? Let me check, I see hand. Callie, thank you very much, Callie. From the enterprise. Public comment. Members of the public are welcome to speak about items that are not on the agenda. Comments should be limited to two minutes in length. Due to the open meeting law, there will be no debate or action taken on public comment items. For items on the agenda, the chair may accept comments from the public following the committee's discussion of an item. Additional comments and feedback can also be submitted by email to school committee at Falmouth dot k12.ma.us. Do we have any public comment on items not on the agenda? If so, please raise your hand icon. Um, Becky Charles. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I just wanted to really thank all the teachers, the school staff, the school nurses, the custodians, and all the administrators in Falmouth for keeping our kids safe for this last year and a half. I know it's been really tough. Um, and I just, I wanted to make sure that they know that they're valued and that we really appreciate them and all the work they've done to keep everyone safe. Um, and that I just, I hope that they are given the opportunity to continue doing so and that their voices are heard tonight. Great, thank you very much, Becky. We appreciate that. Um, any other public comment? Okay. That's Becky. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, seeing none, we'll move to the first item on our agenda, which is to act on FY23 school budget. Oh, sorry. I apologize, Cindy. Okay. I think I apologize, Cindy. So um, if you want to raise your hand again, we'll take you. Oh, you have her. Okay. Hi, Cindy. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Um, tonight, I'd like to address the impact of workload in regards to the Falmouth Education Association and its members. Recently, the Falmouth Education Association has been trying to negotiate a fair contract with the school committee and district administration reflecting both the astronomical cost of living increase and the high salary increase given to the superintendent. If the teachers are only being offered 1.5%, but the superintendent is getting 4%, why is this happening? Additionally, with an understanding of the town police, fire and DPW workers all negotiating fair contracts, why is this not happening to your teachers who have been 100% face-to-face in person for the last two school years? Why have the parents and the staff, both meaningful stakeholders, been left out of ESSER 3 conversations with over $3 million being allocated to Falmouth? Last week, an article was published by the local paper saying over $2.2 million in Chapter 70 funds was also expected to be given to the district. Why is this extra funding also not being discussed with parents and staff? Our teachers and staff need to be given a fair contract that reflects not only the amount of work they have done over the last two years, but also that they are valued, respected, and a vital part of our local community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, Amy Leonardi. Hi, Amy. Hi, everyone. Hi. I, thank you for giving me a chance to speak. I just actually, I wanted to bring up something. It is a question I have put 
um, to both administration and the school committee prior, and I have yet to get an answer. So I'm hoping I can speak it one more time in public comment in hopes that you will um, do some research into this and get us back an answer. Um, as a parent, it has come to our attention, many parents in this, that in grades five through 12, there is an exorbitant amount of time being spent on screens. At Morse Pond in particular, the majority of their day is being spent on the Chromebooks. I am asking the school committee and administration to give us an update. How many minutes a day are they spending on the Chromebooks learning? And how much of that time um, versus hands-on learning not on a screen? Because I think the public would like that information um, for all of us to know. That's it. Great, thank you very much, Amy. Thank you. Um, any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, we will move to the first item on our agenda, which is to act on FY23 school budget in the amount of $52,950,000. Is there a motion? Make a motion. Kelly makes the motion. Is there a second? Second. Um, Bill Ryder seconds. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions or comments? Just Kelly. a quick comment um, to thank Patrick and Laurie and the whole team for putting together another um, really well done budget and managing the process with FinCom and the town. Yes, second that. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, oh, we're all together, so you don't necessarily have to do a roll call on this. Um, seeing none, all in favor of approving the FY23 school budget in the amount of $52,950,000, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you so much, Patrick, for all thank of you. Thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, next up on our agenda is to discuss and act on the mask mandate. Um, before I begin, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the parents, families, and staff members who have emailed the school committee. Um, I think as of 5.45 this evening, we had 128 emails. Um, and so just so that the public knows, when you email the school committee, we each get a copy um, and we read them all and we truly appreciate your thoughts and perspectives. Um, as you know, Governor Baker and Education Commissioner Riley lifted the statewide K through 12 mask mandate effective February 28th. The decision as to whether or not to continue or the, the mandate um, has now been left to local school districts. So we are joined this evening by Scott McGann, the town's health agent, and Dr. Greg Parkinson, the district's physician, who will provide current data related to COVID in our communities. Um, so that the public knows following the presentation, the school committee and superintendent will discuss this matter. And at the conclusion of our deliberation and prior to our vote, I will briefly reopen public comment. Uh, please be aware that public comment will be reserved for anyone who has not already emailed the school committee. Uh, this will give anyone who has not emailed us a chance to be heard. And as always, public comment is limited to two minutes. So I would like to turn it over to Scott and Greg. You want me to go first? Uh, yes, please. Can I share screen just to give you an update like I had been in the past? Yes. Well, hello, everybody. So here we are. I hope everybody can see my screen. This is uh, our weekly case trend. And uh, going from left to right as, as time progressed over the last couple of years of the pandemic, you can see that this Omicron, um, and this is only PCR tests, so the actual case count was some number higher than that because the self-test kind of came in roughly around the same time. Then we had a boatload of cases that came in really fast and it seemed to just tail off as fast as it came. Uh, the case count since uh, Thursday afternoon, these case counts are Thursday afternoon to Thursday afternoon. Uh, prior to the FCTV thing I do every week on Friday, um, is 17. So you can see the trend continues uh, downward. Uh, there's definitely an ebb and flow to, to COVID, um, you no know, doubt about it. And so that's where we are right now with cases, okay? Um, county, Bar Barnstable County, very similar. So the entire county's had the same crest and waves and peaks and valleys that we've had. And they're down with a three-day total, you know, of course, Falmouth is you know, 10% of the population, 11% of the population. So, we, you know, obviously it makes sense that we reflect the same. 
Incidents, these charts, I just want you to look. The state gives us the two full weeks prior to posting these on Thursday afternoon. So this data is January 23rd to February 5th. So it, to me, it's a little dated, but that's how the state gives it to us. Falmouth was in the middle of the road with a, an incidence rate. An incidence rate means how many cases Falmouth would average in a day if there was a population of 100,000. So they adjust the population so that all towns are looked at it equally. We we're at 42.4, and our positivity at that time frame was 8.81. Today, the state's uh, positivity rate is 3.09. So it's definitely, you'd say Falmouth's a lot higher. Going back to the original chart, I'm gonna circle with my cursor, the positivity and the incidence of these two weeks. So, so what I'm saying is, is that the positivity incidence is dropping because next Thursday, it'll be here. So it'll, it'll grab the two weeks that we've had under between 50 and 100. And then the previous week, let's say we continue on with a nice little roll here, we'll be lower. So we're trending towards where the state is. I think just these two charts are a little dated, but that's how the state gives us. So um, all you know, good news in terms of where we were, the Omicron as quick as it came out. Um, hospitalizations were down in that sort of five or six. Uh, we still have unvaccinated people. By and large, unvaccinated people will be those that will you know, end up hospitalized. hospitalized. Uh, the case counts are definite. I mean, the hospitalizations are definitely down. Um, roughly, it looks like half of it was um, less than, you know, roughly half that it was even, you know, several weeks ago. Um, so again, the trends, the cases and the trends are all in good condition right now. Obviously, there's an ebb and flow. There's no guarantee of the future. I, you know, I, I wouldn't venture to tell you what's going to happen in a month or six weeks. Or the only thing I could tell you is it's definitely. Uh, less prevalent in the summer, more prevalent during the winter, but all respiratory viruses, flus, coughs, colds, and stuff like that tend to be that way. And this is not any different from that in terms of how it spreads. It spreads uh, person to person that way. Uh, one of the things I do want you to focus on is this chart here. This comes out every Thursday from the state. So this chart tells us that there's been 434,394 breakthrough cases, which is 8.3% of all vaccinated people in the state. Of those 6,790 or 1.56% of those 434,000 have actually been hospitalized. And that's a, a general population. So that would include those that are very severely immune compromised, multiple comorbidities in age. Um, so that number is definitely dropping. That number was as high as 4% at the beginning. And that's because we continue boosters, vaccines are highly effective. And Omicron had tend to not have that same uh, severity in it um, uh, by and large. Hospitalizations among all vaccinated people is under well under 1% at 0.13%. And the death rate among those that have gotten COVID as a breakthrough is below 1% at a half a percent. And the, the total population is 0.04%. So um, that's good news. Um, we were hoping, you know, uh, that, um, you know, over time that the disease, as we get more vaccines, as we got a vaccine, is... Um, we have gotten more people who've gotten infected and have some of, uh, you know, from infection, some, some immunity and the, 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 the disease itself has varied towards a, a less severe, at least at this point in time that, you know, those are the trends that we're at right now. So I'm going to stop sharing. And if you want, I can just keep going with some of my thoughts going forward. I think if you just for the sake of time. Yep. Um, so over the past few months, the state's been transitioning and away from sort of the crisis pandemic mode. Over the last couple of months, um, we've reduced contact tracing. The state doesn't contact trace. We do not, um, um, it's, it's much more of a, we send the guidance and we tell people that they let their friends and family know. Uh, we don't call all the friends and family. The state's taken that away. Um, we don't even get an immediate notification. So think about my email. I got an email notification of every case. So there's 4,000 emails, right? So I do not get an instant email. Uh, we have to go into our workflows in Maven and, and do what we would normally do with most diseases. Um, we've encouraged home tests, which are off the testing range. So we don't really get into the contact tracing on home tests. So we're really, the state's work towards self-reliance reliance over the last couple of months and how they're looking at it. Um, you know, my other my other point would be that, you know, at schools and here at the health department, we've been beholden to what the DPH and testing guidance has been doing all along. Um, why has the state done that? Well, the vaccine's highly effective and it's available to everyone over the age of five, uh, which would include all your students and all your staff. It is our primary mitigation. Um, there's, you know, we also have treatments. So think about our, you know, think about the days of when we were wiping our Amazon boxes in 2020, right? We're not 
we're not at that point. But why? Why did we do it back then? We didn't know. You know, the severity was worse at that particular. I mean, Delta would be worse than the original, but right now we don't. Um, we have the treatments that we need. Um, they're coming. Um, there's been some production issues, but we'll be getting to that. And so I think that's why the state sort of worked its way away from sort of that, you know, uh, closures and, and all the mitigation things that we did previously is because in 2020, we were really hopeful that we'd get a vaccine, which we did, and we'd get treatments, which we did. So um, we got what we would hope for back if you put yourself back to where you were in the spring of 2020. Um, so mitigation was really designed originally not to be permanent. Um, we were trying to keep, if you remember, hospitalizations down and we didn't want to overwhelm the hospital. So we got into mitigation mainly for that particular, and we were biologic in Falmouth anyway, or in the Cape successful. We didn't, you know, we opened up the Royal, um, the old Royal on main street as an overflow. And we didn't really need to use it. The hospital did that. And, 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 you know, we've, we've been able to sort of uh, fend off at, at any, at any point so far in the pandemic. And so, um, you know, we've got what we need, you know, and then talking with the state today, the state does a call every week and, you know, we had the lead epidemiologist, uh, Dr. Katie Brown, she's brilliant. And, and, you know, she said that, you know, this isn't going to go away. She has no idea what's going to happen in the future. We don't know. Um, but, you know, she did feel that, you know, we're, you know, um, in a point now where we're sort of in an endemic phase where we're sort of, you know, coexisting with the virus. And so, you know, that being said, um, I mean, there is, you know, I'm not a mental health expert. I'm sure masks have done some effects on the kids that I probably would stay away from. That's not really my area. Um, I, you know, anecdotally, I mean, somebody in some child in first grade has gone to school their entire school career with, you know, with masks. And so, you know, that's, you know, there's also some of that. Now, my board of health, we have a board of health meeting every couple of weeks. And, you know, we discuss COVID as an automatic on our agenda. Um, they didn't vote for any recommendations or any give you any guidance other than, you know, there wasn't a consensus. Of course, the board, you know, realizes that masks are a mitigation and, and are effective. Um, but they do also understand as the, you know, component of, you know, continuing on with mandates indefinitely as we're starting to coexist with it. Um, they were curious about the timing, you know, especially coming off a of winter break. Maybe that wasn't the best time for the state to do it. So that was the comments from the board. Um, you know, as far as the health department, we're going to continue to monitor, you know, as things go up and down, as new variants come in, we know, obviously, we need to be able to pivot and be flexible with everything and everything that we do with COVID. You know, and I understand that coexisting with it means different things to different people. And that's sort of been a hard thing with this. Um, but as far as my opinion, I think you can continue to follow the DPH guidance, the DESI guidance that's been provided to you all along. Uh, you could I think you can remove the, the mandate and allow individuals to measure their own risk and make their own decisions. I mean, we're going to be with COVID for a long time. And at some point we think we need to get to a point where we're making our own decisions with it. And obviously if, you know, the next variant comes out and it's, you know, Delta on steroids and we'll have to, you know, you know regroup at that point. So um, the mitigation accomplished what we needed to do. It got us to a point where we were vaccinated. You know, we've gotten boosters, we've gotten treatments. And, um, you know, it might, might be at some point necessary to go back, but, you know, that's my opinion and uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. We appreciate the presentation so and your opinion. We appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Parkinson, I'd like to invite you to join this conversation as well. Sure. Um, and, and thanks for the chance to speak. And once again, thanks to everybody who's worked so hard, you know, trying to, um, trying to keep everybody safe for so long. And, you know, I, I, I think I just, um, as usual, piggyback on, on what Scott said. And, you know, we've, we're now almost two years into this and we're trying to decide, you know, um, what we would, um, you know, what, what, what should be the next move. And a lot of it, has changed since we started doing this, you know, and Scott, you know, mentioned a number of the number of the factors, uh, the, you know, the ability to immunize now, um, the fact that there's a uh, better availability of testing, the fact that there's a higher community immunity, both through immunization and probably to some extent through all the people 
who got Omicron. Um, and, and, you know, and then we take that and we kind of factor in, um, you know, what are the effects on the physical health versus what are the effects on the emotional health? And, you know, when I think about physical health, you know, my mind goes to, you know, my 85 plus year old parents, it goes to, you know, friends on chemotherapy. It goes to, um, you know, uh, ICU admissions and availability of beds. And it also goes to, um, you know, the ability of people to get care that's not COVID related in the hospital, um, which suffers, of course, when there's a, a huge surge of COVID because of the, you know, the the way it taxes the healthcare system and knocks out some of the healthcare workers. And, and so we're in this place right now. And, you know, and I think we have to keep in mind that, um, you know, we're, we're in sort of a contradictory phase because um, on the one hand, we know that this last variant was probably only about one fourth as likely to make you hospitalized but it was also four times as spready. So it was not insignificant in terms of the number of sick people. It was just less likely for any given person to, to cause a problem. And then, you know, we have to look at, um, you know, where we're at now, um, physically, you know, emotional health. And, you know, I, I've kind of used the weather forecast analogy throughout this whole, um, uh, you know, these discussions as a way of trying to frame where we're at. And, you know, if, if a hurricane is coming, which is basically what November just said was going to happen in December and January, and which is what did happen, um, you know, you have, to, you have to prepare for that. Mask use is part of that and all the other things that went into it. You know, when you, when you look at the kind of numbers that we were dealing with in Massachusetts of 24,000 people a day getting sick. It's just an incredibly high number. That's about where we were at four weeks ago. Um, you know, within the last week, we've gone down to 2,000 cases a day. So, you know, you do your exponential uh, math and, you know, would suggest in another two weeks, we're down to about 500 cases a day. So from the weather forecast point of view, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a good forecast. Um, there's no, there's no imminent uh, variance on the horizon. I think we have to be aware of that. Um, you know, moving forward, uh, you know, a little proactive on that if that kind of thing does happen. Uh, we're heading into spring when hopefully um, things will improve because they typically do, uh, both for virus reasons and the fact that people get outdoors. And so. You know, I mean, just to sum that up, we're heading into a low, you know, into a trough of cases and we're heading into a good season and we don't have a variant out there, which is, you know, uh, about to start. And so people listening to me, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, you, you know, will we'll know I, I, I'm relatively conservative on this, trying to protect the vulnerable people. But I, I think that also we have to say, um, you know, when the opportunity presents itself, um, you know, it, you have to be reasonable and not just reactive because of fear of something that there isn't the data to support. So right now where we're moving, um, you know, is, is to better weather and, as much as, as I said, as I've been conservative in the past, you know, I, th I think we have to give a chance for some normalcy when it presents itself and it, it appears to be presenting itself. Um, that's not to say like Scott said, if things turn, we have to be able to say it's, um, it's, uh, it's, we would pivot. Um, we have to be able to say that we're, um, you know, not um, gonna, ignore something that's coming. Um, but I think we also have to say, hey, if we try this and it doesn't go well, then we have to be uh, responsive to that. But I think, you know, we also have to be reasonable and say, you know, we know that all this 
um, you know, prevention stuff we've been doing has, you know, a mental health component to it. And we're now at a point where maybe we should think about trying to, uh, trying to see if we can um, go without the masks, uh, you know, in the, in the schools. I'm not talking about healthcare or yeah, I'm not talking about people who are vulnerable or, um, you know, other special situations, but specifically in the schools. And then the other question, you know, just to be preemptive about it is, well, what about when they get back from school versus waiting a couple of weeks? Um, and, you know, I think you could argue that one. Um, uh, you know, what I've said before is if you're, if you have 20,000 cases a day, and let's say you get a 10% bump after the holidays, well, that's 2000 cases. If you have 2000 cases a day and you get a 10% bump, that's 200 cases across the whole state, uh, you know, so of which we maybe get two more cases than we would uh, if we don't wait. Um, so I, I think because the numbers are going down, a bump, you know, percentage wise might look like a lot, but in terms of the real number of cases, probably it's going to be low. And, and then the last thing I'll say is looking back at what happened last year, we did have a bump in the spring, but at least statewide, it was more of a mid-March into April bump rather than right on the heels of school vacation. So I'm not convinced that waiting that you know, week or two or whatever after vacation really would impact in the way you'd want it to. This has been very helpful. Um, thank you. So school committee, any questions or comments for um, either Scott or Greg? Leah. Um, so I have a question. I, it's just, you know, things come at us so fast that are different and sometimes conflicting. And um, the commissioner had put out prior to last week that if a school had 80% or more vaccinated, that that would allow the school to decide, you know, to unmask, um, but that vaccinated people would still be masked. There's been a sea change with this. And I'm just wondering a little bit about the medical reason for this or research base or data that would support this change of the commissioner having coming out with that um, mandate and now that we have a different one. I would say, first of all, 80% uh, vaccination rate in schools is based on, you know, unless there was some overwhelming um, change in popular opinion, is just not going to happen. Um, and so if we waited for that metric, you'd be looking at the entire school year uh, with, um, you know, with people uh, masked, is what I suspect. The, the second thing is that um, you know, we do have um, the benefit of knowing that, um, you know, in some ways, I mean, that, that came out before the Omicron variant. I mean, the Omicron variant, as, you know, shown by that um, statistic that Scott showed with the huge yeah. spike, I mean, there were a huge number of people got that. Suspicion is you know, it's hard to know. We know that one variant doesn't necessarily confer immunity to future variants, but it certainly helps. And it helps in terms of severity of infection. So I, I think those two things are what I would point to and say that, that they're different. Plus the fact we're heading into spring. So there's one other piece to that because there was also the mandate that unvaccinated would have to still mask. So just medical opinion about that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that there's a, I'm not sure that that's a medical uh, question as much as it is one that um, ties in a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of differences of view of the world uh, as much as I'm a, a mask. Um, proponent. I, I think it's, I think, you know, that's not, that's not for me to make, that's the decision of the committee, but um, it, it, it would invite a lot of um, consternation, I would suspect. And you'd have to ask at what 
benefit. So just a clarification of that, because um, I was under the impression that that was to protect people who are unvaccinated from contracting COVID. Um, so I think that's that was my mindset of it, but just. Well, that's, that is, uh, it's true that, I mean, when you mask, you protect yourself and you protect other people. Um, you know, uh, people have chosen to vaccinate or not at this point. They've chosen to vaccinate their children or not at this point. Um, there is a pretty strong correlation between people who have chosen not to vaccinate and who um, are um, pushing to become uh, unmasked. And as I say, I think um, you have to say um, what is the net gain of that? And, you know, in terms of cases, there probably would be some. Um, whether it justifies uh, a policy is not for me to say. Andrea. Um, I think Bill had his hand up first. Oh, sorry. Um, first of all, I want to echo the appreciation for everybody who has emailed in. And we have heard a wide variety of arguments that were well thought out um, from many different standpoints. Um, one of the things that I saw that came up on, on a fairly regular basis um, for those who were concerned is that um, you know the CDC guidance seems to be different sometimes than what um, local places are doing and so forth. And, and, and Scott, you did a great job of showing us some numbers from Falmouth and from Barnstable County. And we're, we're talking about a, a local issue here and, and the situation that we're in in Falmouth and in Massachusetts and New England. So I, I just wanna clarify um, that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when the CDC is making decisions, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow and I'm, I'm gonna be wearing this and I don't see that going anywhere anytime soon. The, the CDC has to make those decisions based on the numbers across the entire country, correct? So, so they're taking into account states like Alabama, Wyoming, Mississippi, Los Angeles, or uh, not Los Angeles, <laughs> the other LA, Louisiana, um, and, and the numbers there and the vaccination rates, they have to take all of that into account for nationwide policy. Would that be correct? Yep. Right, so just to clarify, I see this more as a, a decision where it would probably be best to look at our local numbers versus something that's averaged out across the country. Would, would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, if we had a 20% vaccination rate, we'd have a higher case count. Right. We don't have a vaccination of 20%. Going back to that chart, 96% of the eligible residents have had at least one dose in this town. So. Yeah, you got to kind of look at it locally. And getting back to the Fed versus state, I'll give you another example, the food code. The FDA writes a food code. The state can choose whether they want to adopt it or not. The FDA food code has no weight until a state adopts it. And it's the same thing with guidance from, uh, from the CDC on this. The states would choose to adopt it. So we followed the state. Um, in, in the absence of the state, would look at the CDC. But that's that's... Yeah, so you know they, they have to look at what's going on elsewhere and what what it, what it looks like and, and make a call for everybody, not just you know locally. Right, yeah. and I, I know a lot of people were concerned, but just just for everyone out there listening, Massachusetts, as far as the fifty the fifty states, is is fifth in the country as far as vaccination rates, and the other four are Connecticut, Maine, Vermont, and Rhode Island. So yes, you know, we th those five states are in the top five for vaccination rates. So essentially, sorry, I didn't mean to Louisiana. So the state, the state of Massachusetts, is saying you can reap what you sow, and since you guys did a great job vaccinating, you can, you know, this is where we're at. And like I said earlier in my discussion, that the state's moving towards the endemic sort of, you know, treating it like, you know, other diseases as opposed to sort of, you know, the immediacy that was uh, the prior two years, that really, you know put a lot of burden on the health departments, no doubt. Um, but yeah, so I think the state saying, you know, you know, high vaccination rates. And I think they're really looking at that chart I showed you that shows you that, 
you know, hospitalizations among those who are vaccinated clearly to me show the vaccines work. There's just no if, ands, or buts about it. So, thank you, um, Andrea. Um, yes, I, I actually have two questions for Dr. Parkinson. Um, the first one, I, I was just sort of rethinking based on what Scott was just saying there, but I guess I, I'm wondering we're looking at vaccination rates and we have a bunch of data for our schools. And do you consider, do you see a difference between um, what we used to consider fully vaccinated with two doses and having a booster? Because we, we're noticing there's just a really low number on uh, the percentage that are, have been boosted. Do you see there any differences, um, you know, I guess with, uh, you know, the severity or hospitalizations or anything that we should be concerned about there? Yeah, that, no, you're right. That is a concern, Andrea. And, and um, you know, being vaccinated and not boosted definitely confers protection versus being unvaccinated, but being boosted definitely confers protection over not being boosted. And, um, and so, um, you know, if, if I, I was looking at a statistic overall, you know, uh, uh, the rate of death among, um, if you compare uh, vaccinated, not boosted people to unvaccinated people, it's now about 12, 12 fold, but vaccinated and boosted, you're about 50 times less likely uh, to, to die of COVID. So I think that um, in, the, in the younger age group, we are actually seeing quite a bit of that where we, we and I, I think I would use your question as a, as a call to remind everybody to still get your booster. Um, it, it continues to help and hopefully this is not going to be too frequent down the road, but uh, you know, yes, that it, it is important. Thank you. Um, and my second question was, uh, I was wondering what your experience has been um, with COVID and children under the age of five. Um, what are you seeing in your practice there? Since we know that that's a group that is not eligible to get a vaccine and we do have pre-K programs in our schools. Right, so um, it's a good question. And fortunately, um, relatively speaking, uh, COVID tends to be a very mild illness in young children, in most young children. Now, if you go nationwide and you go, um, you know, kids with, um, you know, uh, underlying conditions uh, and, and you look at the numbers, you know, in terms of, you know, we'll get to this at a later date in, in terms of, you know, vaccination for that age group. But overall, you know, most of the viral illnesses, if you look at the flu, for example, the point I make every day in the office is even before we immunized everybody and we only immunized the elderly and the, um, and the people with diabetes and asthma, et cetera, we also immunized the under twos. Um, COVID thankfully does not seem to have that same effect on young people, you know, the, the flu and RSV are significantly more severe illnesses uh, for the young than um, those are. And, and I think it's good to throw those out as a comparison because you can never say never with these things. Um, we don't have a vaccine for RSV. Vast majority of kids get through it okay, but a substantial number of babies get hospitalized and there's some, you know, can be some deaths involved. Uh, the flu, we have a vaccine, we, we recommend it, you know, but both of those unvaccinated are more severe illnesses on average than COVID is. Thank you so much. Great, and Laurie, since we we're speaking of vaccination rates, could you give us a quick snapshot of where we are in our schools at this point? Uh, yes, yeah, so our uh, vaccinated staff is at 85%. And vaccinated students overall is 55.4%, broken down into age groups. Uh, five, and, five to 11 year olds is 43%, 12 to 15 year olds, 65.5%, and 16 to 19 year olds is 76%. Excellent. And also, do we know um, the new program where we can do at home testing about where do we rest with those numbers with staff and students? 
Uh, yeah, so the at-home testing program, we have 454 staff members participating. We have 1,159 students participating. Thank you. How does that, what is that percentage? Uh, I can pull that up somewhere. Basically a third of the students, because we're right. about 3,000. Yeah. And about 85, what is it? 30. So sorry. Three fourths for staff. Yeah. Seventy five. I have eight. I have eighty five, but it's to be seventy five yeah. between seventy five and eighty five percent. Yeah. Eighty five. Okay. Um, questions. Any other questions, Melissa? Dr. Parkinson, can you speak to natural immunity? How long does it last? People that have had the vac. People that have uh, had the. Uh, vaccine and then have still broke through with the COVID, people that have not had the vaccine but have got the COVID, and what does our natural immunity look like? Just a quick snapshot, if you could. Yeah, how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> so in a quick, like, so I'm really no, not- I, I understand, I, I understand. I'm, asking I'm, just I'm harassing you because I, I know better than that. <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, it first of all, um, this is a you know this is a work in progress, and we we know that infection confers some immunity. We know that vaccination confers immunity. Um, with vaccination, you've got which, you know, pick which vaccine you're using, pick how many doses you've had with uh, infection, pick, pick which variant you've had and pick which variant is coming. So for example, one of the things that we found was that, um, you know, there was the standard, um, you should be okay for 90 days if you've been infected um, and, and unlikely to get infected again in that period of time. Omicron didn't really follow those rules. And there were some people who were less than 90 days since Delta who got it. So that's why I say, you know, how long have you got? Because it really depends on, uh, you know, which vaccine you got, which variant you got, um, which variant is coming. And, and so I, I think we can safely say that all of those confer some immunity. It, it appears that none of them confer permanent immunity. And it appears that um, the more you have, whether it's uh, vaccination or you got over an infection, you know, the, the, the higher number of ticks you get in your, in your COVID uh, box that probably confers more protection from serious illness. And you know that that's about as that's about as quick as I can make. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions for Scott or Dr. Parkinson? Leah, I just um, I'm not sure this is really a question, but I I think that you know it it is a wonderful asset to have in our schools now to be able to provide home testing for all of our staff and all of our students. Um, I guess just. Dr. Parkinson, and, and I guess this would be for, for Scott too, of looking at, I know that there was a lot of talk about, you know, PCR versus the home testing, but do you feel that the home tests would provide a level of um, just safety for our students and staff if, if they were done consistently at home? Um, it's, it's a trade-off and, you know, uh, as you know, and, and I, I, you know, I, I feel for the average lay person because even with, you know, medical background, the, the, the number of, you know, uh, things that come at you and the changing opinion um, really makes a difference in terms of what we say about these things. And keeping in mind that not all home tests are created equal and you wanna have one that's FDA approved and has a reasonable level of sensitivity. But um, I, I, would, I would say, you know, again, just to try and make something very complicated as, as straightforward as they can make it is that 
Um, if you want to know about the presence of COVID period or not to, to uh, you know, uh, then the best test is the PCR test. Um, but sometimes the sensitivity is so good that it's actually picking up an infection that's not current. And so the tests that the, um, the rapid test is tended to miss tend to be the, I mean, the, the positives that it's tended to miss uh, are more likely to be people without symptoms um, because your viral load is not as high and you need a higher viral load to be picked up on the, on the rapid you know, antigen test. Now, having said that in terms of cost and in terms of availability, the rapid test is far in, um, in, you know, in, the, in the pros column in terms of that. And you know, the way that things are going is that if, um, if you, uh, you know, have a widely available rapid test at home in the perfect world where everybody had them at home and everybody was conscientious and at the first sign of anything, they did a test at home and maybe they do a test one day later because two rapid tests is really quite good. Um, so if you are negative the first time and you still have symptoms that seem suggestive, you know, 24 to 48 hours later, you do a second one and two negative rapid tests and, and that approaches the sensitivity of the, of the PCR test. So, you know, um, what I'm saying is, um, you know, if we want to, um, you know, get the best bang for our buck in terms of what the average person at home has. Uh, you know, if we all had an endless supply of rapid antigen tests and could test ourselves liberally whenever we needed to, that would really make a huge difference. And that's kind of where we're being pushed to go. And I think for good reason. So I guess I would conclude, you know, this part of the the discussion by saying, I really do encourage people to sign up for those tests with their kids because it is very valuable to have at home to, you know, you test yourself at home, you catch it earlier, you expose less people, you don't expose the healthcare worker uh, by going there, um, you avoid jamming up the healthcare system um, so that, you know, people that are waiting six hours to get a test in the emergency room and it keeps the, the trauma from, you know, getting as, as, as much attention as it should. So bottom line is if, you know, please sign up for the rapid test program. Thank you. You're good? Okay, thank you. Um, and so a question for Lori, it's a two part question. Number one, could you speak to, um, you know, we received feedback from families and some staff members via email. Could you report on um, the, the, the feedback that you receive via a survey. And then part two is if we uh, vote to lift the mandate, could you speak to the mitigation strategies that will still be in place at the schools? Sure, so um, first I wanna thank um, all of our, our union groups um, for, uh, for taking polls um, so that they can give us feedback so our food service custodians and secretaries agree with the uh, mask optional, meaning to lift um, the mask on the 28th and then allow um, individuals to choose uh, whether to, um, to wear a mask or not wear a mask. Um, a specific uh, shout out to the FDA union um, that they conducted a full survey among their uh, members um, to, to provide feedback for the school committee tonight. Um, so thank you for that. Um, they had 188 uh, respond. This was as of last Friday. 60% um, were in favor of ending the mask update. 31% were against ending the mask update, but many wrote in comments that they would uh, be okay with it at a later date. Uh, and 9% had no opinion. So when you look at that, it would be 90 or 69% um, that would be okay with ending the mask mandate. Thank you. And mitigation strategies. Yeah, so we do have a, uh, just to remind everyone, we have a COVID team that meets uh, every Friday or most Fridays. Um, uh, now and then there's, there may be a conflict and part of the, the, or the COVID team consists of uh, Dr. Parkinson, uh, Scott McGann, our uh, nurse coordinator, uh, Lori Wiesman, 
uh, Dr. Joan Woodward and uh, our two uh, COVID uh, team members, um, Asia uh, and uh, Paul. And so we meet Friday, we bring in people uh, when there are specific questions, like a principal about an event or so that's at the school that um, has a specific question. So what we will be doing is monitoring the data uh, closely, and we will still be advising um, on specific activities and events moving forward. Uh, following the DESE guidance, which we have done uh, since the beginning, um, there are exceptions to um, lifting the mask mandate. Uh, we would still be wearing a mask on the school buses because that was a federal mandate. Uh, and then uh, all students and staff returning to school on day six, um, asymptomatic or symptom resolving, uh, following a positive COVID test uh, would also need to wear a mask um, through day 10. And we would still be wearing masks in our school health offices. Uh, also, um, would say, um, uh, <laughs> so we recommend this, the, the, um, the, from the DESE guidance, it was recommended that if you're unvaccinated, that you continue to, to wear a mask. And so that's a recommendation, not a mandate. Um, you know, so that that can be in place. And I agree with um, Dr. Parkinson and, and Scott, um, anyone that wants to wear a mask um, can wear a mask. We have plenty of uh, KN95s um, that anyone could have at any time to wear if that makes people more comfortable. Um, we also have a surgical masks all through our schools uh, if that makes people comfortable. And uh, I do believe um, that our, our staff is wonderful. And I believe that they'll make um, uh, their colleagues and students feel comfortable uh, wearing a mask um, if that's what people choose to, to do. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions for either Greg or Scott or Dr. Dorr? Um, I have a couple questions yeah. for, for Lori. So um, something that Dr. Parkinson mentioned um, that it would be great if you had a sore throat and you decided to test before exposing anybody, which would be wonderfully responsible and maybe prevent other people from getting exposed, but that sore throat might not happen on Wednesday morning. So, um, which is when we test mm -hmm. if you're in the program. So do we have the ability to provide all those participating staff and families, you know, a bonus one so that they could you know, how would that, do we have, is that an option? I know that it's a complicated process to get the test to them, but if we could encourage people to use them, not just on Wednesday, but if you feel lousy on Monday morning, please use your test. Uh, I mean, correct. I mean, this, this is a state program and they are um, only allowing, so we only get um, the number of tests delivered that are in the program. Okay. And we only get, um, a, we're only allowed a test, um, one kit every two weeks, two, two tests. So that would be each week. With that said, um, we have purchased our own test and we are trying to um, use them strategically. We don't have, uh, you know, unlimited um, testing. For instance, um, working collaboratively with uh, the FEA, uh, we've, um, they had made a suggestion that if we could possibly um, provide an extra test. So on uh, the day of returning that the staff and students that are participating on the 28th, the morning of the 28th, they would have a test to, um, to give, to take that morning. Right. Um, and then the other test. So that means everyone will have a, one additional test at home okay. because the, the boxes have two in it. So if people would use one that morning, and then they would have one other. Um, we also have the symptomatic testing in school, right? So if anyone's having any type of symptoms, uh, we do have the test kits uh, in the schools for the symptomatic uh, staff or students. Uh, and that certainly uh, is a, an assessment of the nurse and their expertise, um, whether that's you know, necessary or not necessary, or you know, um, even if 
symptoms seem non-COVID, but related, you know, they still may send a student home as they have for years, um, you know, for colds, flus, you know, um, that type of thing, uh, the normal. So with the symptomatic testing and our weekly testing um, that we, we have, and then this additional test kit that we were fortunate that we were able to, to uh, provide our um, participating families. So, so I just want to make mm -hmm. sure I, I get it. So everyone who's part, so the, the, program that you're mentioning at the request of um, FEA's idea to have that extra one, which I think is brilliant because we're all gonna be coming back together. It, because the tests come in too, everybody who's participating will have a test for that day and then they would have an extra one. Is that what you're saying? Yes, so, so they would have okay, an extra so one. Okay, so we kind of them. already are doing that. Kind of, yeah, kind of. I don't know that we can just- Continue it for us. Right, because we only have X amount and. Um, of test, they're not easy to get and they're extremely um, expensive. I think I want to get, um, Patrick has done a great job at uh, being able to, you know, find the test for us, but it's just not unlimited that we could do that at all times. Um, I also want to point out that there's a federal website um, that you can get for free tests. Uh, every family could do that and have that. Um, yeah, ask as well. for it now because I I did it the first day and I still didn't get my. Oh, no, I just, <laughs> okay, I didn't I didn't know that. But okay. Um, um, well, well, and, insurance, <laughs> and the reason one of the reasons that I asked is sure, not yeah. um, is also because the tests are expensive, mm -hmm. and you know, it's it's not right that this is a healthcare matter that all of our families need, and many do not have access to. So. Um, if there's the opportunity, you know, beyond what the, what the school is already able to provide. I just think it's a, a really important piece. So one additional um, strategy that, that, we, um, that we used uh, is that um, those that are under the um, participating with the um, family or the uh, Falma Service Center, mm -hmm. um, we've provided tests through them for the oh, families. Okay. So that was part of the um, mitigating strategy that we used when we purchased the test. So um, families that qualify through the Family Service Center are receiving tests. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, my Tiff, sorry, can I add a little thing about that? Just keep in mind there is a use uh, best of use by date, so to speak, and some of them are relatively short. I think the ones I had were November. So just keep that in mind when you order and keep that in mind when you have them at home that there is a, an expiration date to that. That's all. Yeah, thank thank you. you. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then my, my second question is around um, some of the mitigation strategies that you mentioned that from day six to day 10, um, returning staff and students would be required to mask. And I'm just wondering, you know, logistically, how do we think that might happen? Is there a plan in place? Like, how does it happen now? And will that sort of inform that type of um, process? Because I imagine it's complicated. Uh, true. Our numbers are much lower right now. Uh, and I mean, we certainly have on record that um, we have our administration staff, the nurses uh, that have access to that. Uh, so we know um, who's been, well, identified, um, who's been uh, out with COVID. So we know um, when they come back. Okay. So we do have a, um, a system that uh, identifies that a certain student will be back on a certain day and the, the administration then knows that, that that student would be wearing a mask. And certainly that's then passed um, to, to the staff all through the day. Okay. So there is something in place that we have been doing. Okay, that. and it would just sort of follow that follow same through. model. Yeah. I feel like I had another question, but I can't think of it. Maybe it'll come to me later. <laughs> Leah, um, so I, I, have, I have a couple of things, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump on that because, um, so, Actually, I totally forgot what that was. So I'm going to go oh, back to my other letter. Thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go back to my other thing. So I was, you know, one thing that I do think is missing on what um, the the guy there the required pieces around masking are right now is um, we are doing the in school symptomatic mm -hmm. testing, and it doesn't say anything about a child who is sick having to wear a mask. So um, I'm just wondering about that. So again, we would use the expertise of the nurse, uh, okay. whether the uh, child would 
or staff member would be tested, whether that they would be sent home, which is a typical practice when we have um, children that have colds or flu, you know, flu like symptoms would be sent home mm -hmm. anyway. So um, until symptoms resolve. Okay, but there's no masking. I, that's I, that. It's just that seems like a, maybe a missing piece there. <clears throat> Uh, certainly something that we could bring up at our COVID team meeting this Friday um, to discuss. Yeah, because that mm -hmm. just makes sense yep. to me. Uh, can I answer that? If the kid, if a child says they have flu-like symptoms, put the mask on the child immediately. That, that, that should be pretty straightforward, I think, no? Um, I just, we would have to make that part of, yep. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think maybe it was an oversight because I think the expectation was that you would do that if there was, but yeah, I mean, that's probably an oversight on Desi when they wrote it. Okay, now I have two questions, so I'm going to let well, you finish yours. Yeah, okay. So, so I, oh, just, yeah. I, I just wanted to um, also talk about the home tests because I do think that what I like about the home tests and, and that what I heard very clearly from parents is wanting to have kind of a say on how they are protecting their children and whether their children are masking or not. But I like this ability of being able to kind of determine sometimes whether or not you need to use that home test. I know in my house, um, you know, we are all signed up, me through my own school district, my kids through their school districts. And um, so I just feel like when someone is symptomatic in my house, I have resources available to me right there. And I have been able to do what, what Dr. Parkinson was talking about of there's symptoms in the house, I'm able to test and then retest. And um, so I think that, you know, signing up for this program, it does give some flexibility, though I know there's the recommendation of doing it on Wednesdays, but if someone is symptomatic during that time, you have a resource there to use. Um, so I just wanted to add that to why I think it's really important to sign up for this. Thank you. Uh, Melissa. Um, I just had a quick question about the wearing of the mask when you have uh, cold, like, there's a lot of kids that have allergies and I just mm -hmm. want to make sure that that piece isn't missing mm -hmm. just because you're sneezing and your eyes are watery doesn't mean that you're um, any if you have allergies which a lot of people do I don't want that piece to go missing and have them be uh, wearing masks unnecessarily because it makes it worse. <laughs> so that's, that's why I always say, let's go back to the expertise of our nurses yes. that have done this for years and they know their children, right? right. And that's, um, we have a wonderful nursing staff and I would like to defer to, to them on, on these type of- situations. I just wanted to have yeah, this I, nurse's yeah. view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put out there. Yeah, absolutely. Andrea. Um, Lori, I was wondering if um, you've had time to talk through um, what types of strategies or changes might need to be in place for our pre-K programs? Any new plans for that? So it's on uh, the topic to discuss this Friday. I don't know if Dr. Parkinson or Scott wants to say anything now, but it is on okay. the, my list. All right, yeah, <laughs> great. Well, Thank you. Thanks. So, um, any other? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I finally remember what my first one was. Um, so in that, it's coming back to that six to 10 day window. So our expectation is that um, people returning will be masked um, because there are so few requirements to be masked that it would be optional except for certain circumstances. If families refuse to mask, then what? Do, is it an excused absence? Are they unexcused? Um, are you saying if we don't? No, I'm saying if our expectation is that people are masked in the six to 10 day window oh, and the families days. don't, um, allow that to happen. They, so they would, they right, would, they would, go, home. They would right, go home. They would go home. It would be um, an unexcused absence or depending on the city, I guess that's a case by case thing, but yeah. I just wanted to, I wanted, they would go home. They, I, that's yes. basically what I was yes. wondering. And then, um, which has been the practice up through now. So that, that, that strategy would not change. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh -huh. Yes. So I just, I had a follow up. I'm so glad you brought that up because that was exactly what I wanted to talk about. So I'm just thinking, and I don't know what this is, what this would look like in our schools if the majority of staff and students are going to be unmasked if we pass this. But I'm I'm thinking in that situation where most people are typically unmasked, and then we have our students and our staff who are in that six to ten days masking. 
I just feel like, you know, that is their own private health information that we're like now viewing because we now see, especially if they weren't masked before, now they're masked um, because that is their, it's. So yeah. I, I just, um, because everyone has a choice whether to mask or not. And that may not be, if you wanna start on the 28th that you're masked, does it mean that on March 15th, you're gonna mask, right? Or you might pick it back up at different times. I do think we're gonna see a lot of uh, staff and students that are masking or may not be masking, um, you know, which we also see in public. Yeah. I, think, I think our adults are going to make it um, extremely acceptable for people to wear a mask. And, and I, I do hear what you're saying. I mean, there, there can be concerns, but um, I'm gonna go back to one of the things that Scott says is that we gotta live with this. We gotta figure out how, how to live with this. And um, there, are, there are certain recommendations or mandates around this that um, it's a part of it. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, you make a great point uh, because obviously we can make masks optional, but behavior can't be optional. You've got to toe the line on behavior as far as maybe dehumanizing the student who has a mask on and I don't, or what, whatever. So I think the teachers, the administration has to be really, really demanding on that and real realistic on that. Uh, but but I, you know, I take your point. I think about that as a, as a principal at one time and looking at kids and harassing and, and no, there's, there's no room for that. Make mass optional. Behavior is not, you have to come in here and behave and not intimidate and uh, harass other kids who may be masked. I do agree with Dr. Durr that uh, masks will come on and off if, if we so make it optional. Uh, one comment I have to make is when this whole process started, we were going to, as a committee, vote to have mask or not have mask. And Desi stepped in the day before and indicated that everybody will mask. Now we're at the point where Desi came in again and said, the 28th, you make the decision. We feel scientifically, professionally that, and again, I thank Scott and Dr. Parkinson's for their input. Man, has that been great because I'm one of those individuals that look at it and say, well, come back to 28. The timing on this is terrible. And maybe it's not. But Desi's made that recommendation. And I look at that recommendation and said, you did the science. You did the legwork. You did the previous legwork. And we should look at that and think of that very seriously. Um, any other questions or comments by school committee members? Yes. I would, I would just like to echo, I actually had that written down as a point, uh -huh. uh, what Bill Ryder just said is that we, we made a point of trusting Desi's judgment um, at one point. And I think it would be, I don't know, maybe even hypocritical if we now said, well, now, now we, don't, we don't trust their, their judgment, their expertise. Thank you. I will briefly open public comment to anyone who has not emailed the school committee already. Um, and then part two is because this is part of public record, we ask that you make sure that your first and last name is listed um, because we do have to record who uh, shares public comment. So we'll start with Geraldine Camilli and I apologize if I said your last name incorrectly. Yep. Thank you. No, that was correct. Uh, my name is Geraldine Camilli. Uh, I'm the parent of a vaccinated first grader at Mullen Hall and of a three-year-old who is not yet eligible for any approved vaccine at this time. Uh, Governor Baker recently lifted the mask mandate for schools, citing the low transmission rate in schools, but without acknowledging that the low rate likely relies on children wearing masks in schools. 
as our health agent pointed out, most hospital cases are patients who were not vaccinated. He also mentioned that vaccines and treatment are widely available, but neither of these are available to young children, at least not for another few months. We also have very limited information about the long-term effects of COVID for this vulnerable population. I, like many parents with younger children, have been relying on masks to keep my youngest child safe. She interacts with her brother, but also at preschool with children who have siblings in family schools. Mitigation is the only protection from breakthrough cases for them right now. Without masks, we're unnecessarily exposing them and all those who cannot be vaccinated. There is no vaccine available for young children at this time, but we're getting very close. Pfizer is planning on applying for approval in April, removing the masks in schools right now right after the return from school vacation is exposing young children before they can even be vaccinated. Please hear the voices who cannot be heard and cannot vote. Our young children who cannot yet be protected still rely on mitigation measures like masks. Thank you for hearing my comments tonight. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you. Um, and I just would like to remind um, Christy and William that we need your first and last name before we are able to call on you. So we're going to move to rate. Can you tell them how to do it? They might not know how to change their name. Okay. So I'm going to walk Sorry. you through it. Yeah. So there are three. If you hover over your box, there are three three dots. If you click on that, you should see an option to um, change your name or add your last name. So while uh, you're working through that, and same for Mark, if you could just make sure that your last name appears. So Christy, William, and Mark, uh, your last names need to appear. So we will go to J uh, Rachel. Jacuba, and I apologize if I, what is that? It's right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you did fine. Thanks so That's much. Can you hear me? Too. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So yeah, so I'm Rachel Jacuba and I have two kids at North Falmouth Elementary School, a second grader and a fourth grader. And I just wanted to say that, first of all, I really have um, appreciated all the safety measures that the schools have had in place that I've felt really safe sending my kids to school. Um, and I think that as we decide, you know, whether to take masks on or off, I think one thing that would be really valuable is to tie it to some level of, um, of community spread or number of positive cases in the community. I mean, as Scott said earlier, it's all, you know, we have, there are very local possibilities of transmission. And I think that you know, hopefully Omicron is the last variant we see where we have to be really concerned about this, but I don't know that that's the case. And so I think if we make a decision to take the masks off, I would really encourage the, the school committee and, and the um, administration to, to have that tied to some metric that we could fall back on if we need to, if there is, um, you know, heaven forbid, another wave that we have to be concerned about. So I would really encourage um, thinking about when we take the masks off to be tied to a level of, a, you know, a low level of positive case rates in the, um, in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Rachel. You, Rachel. Um, so once again, Chrissy, William, and Mark. Oh, okay. Hang on one second. Yeah. We're going to work okay. through our, our yeah. technology. Yeah. Technology yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, they're not sure that they can do it uh, as an attendee to change their, their name. So, um, so if they are started. promoted, Okay, yeah, we'll or they maybe just tell okay, us. yeah, yeah, okay, okay, that's good. To okay, so Chrissy, um, we will promote you, and if you could tell us your first and last name, please. And you're muted at this point. Hi, Chrissy, you're still. Muted. I'll give you a few more seconds and then I'll move to William and come back to you if necessary. Okay, uh, Chrissy, while you work through that, because you're still muted, so we can't hear you if you're speaking, um, we will go to William. Um, there you go. Hi, oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> Hi, could you tell us your name, please? Hi, this is, um, this is Sarah and William Langdon. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. 
Um, so we're the parents of a kindergartner student at T-Ticket Elementary. And uh, we just wanna let you guys know the reason why you should all vote to make masks optional. Um, and here's the reason. So high quality masks are now widely available. As, as you've said, you have them readily available for people that, that need them or want them. Vaccines are widely available. As Dr. Parkinson mentioned, there is the availability of testing and there is an increase in immunity um, from people having COVID as the charts from uh, Scott showed. So we have several layers of protection. Um, one of those layers is wearing a mask and one way masking in particular with a high quality mask, such as the N95, which is readily available, it does protect the person wearing it. So if people around your child are not wearing masks, you can still choose for your child to mask and that would offer an extra layer of protection. Every family has to make the right decision for them. And that's what this comes down to. So please do the right thing and vote to make masks optional. Thank you, um, that's all. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, and Chrissy. I think you are still. I wonder mute. if it's that problem with the old version. It, it could be. I'm Chris, not getting that error. No, you're not getting that error. No. Okay. So uh, we will move forward, and I believe William was Sarah. Yeah. Correct? Okay. Perfect. Um, so Sarah, if you could put your hand down, that would be wonderful. Um, is there any other public comment? I, I just want to make one point of clarification. Um, the the. As far as the, the mask availability goes, uh, you know, we might well be able to get kids to wear KN95 masks. Uh, I've been totally overwhelmed in a positive way with the ability of kids to wear masks. I think expecting young kids to wear N95 masks as somebody who's worn one uh, regularly since this, uh, it's not really feasible to expect a young kid to wear an N95 mask all day long. It, there is, it's a whole other level of discomfort um, that those of us in healthcare are well familiar with and people with underlying conditions. But um, so just just point of clarification. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike Halen. Okay, is this working, I hope? Hi. Hi. Oh, awesome, thank you. Uh, Michael Halen, Cliffwood Lane. I just wanted to jump on. I've been watching all night and thank you all for what you do. And thank you, Scott and uh, Dr. Parkinson. Um, I just wanted to thank all the kids who wrote letters. I read some online today and it's been a rough couple of years for these kids, but, and the parents and the teachers and staff. But I want to say that for the last two years, these kids in our district did everything that they were asked to do from Desi. And if Desi and and Governor Baker are going to change the guidelines come uh, March 1st. If we've been following them and Scott and Dr. Parkinson seem to be in line, why would we stop following the guidances now? And uh, thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Mike, do you have a mm -hmm. um, just, We're just gonna touch on that. Um, v. Anderson, could you tell us your first and last name, please? Um, oh, am I unmuted? Yes, you, you're fine. Oh. We can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, Valerie Anderson. Um, I have a daughter at Falmouth High School, and I have a daughter at the Upper Cape. Um, they will be going into their senior year um, come September, and they've spent their entire um, high school experience, you know, and I know it's not the fault. I mean, it, it is what it is. Um, I'm coming from a point of, uh, as a mother with a daughter who has suffered severe anxiety, took to self-harming. Um, I'm not asking 
you know, the ma mandates be for everyone. I, I just want it to be optional um, because maybe mental health isn't a significant portion to you, but it has affected our family dramatically. It's been such an emotional roller coaster. And I'm just asking that they get to enjoy, you know, some of what's left of their high school experience. And, you know, I appreciate you allowing me to talk. A um, little nervous, sorry, I hate public speaking, but um, <laughs> so, that, <laughs> um, so I am coming and I, I have many other mothers whose children have experienced depression, self-harm, um, suicidal ideations. This has been extremely stressful and I feel like it's time to give them some sort of normalcy and a chance to appreciate, you know, they've been courageous, they've been brave. I think it's time for us to be brave and allow them to enjoy their childhood. And if they want to, ma you know, if, if parents want their children masked, I'm 100% for them. No one's going to bully any, you know, we're not, I know we're not that kind of family. I'm just asking for some sort of normalcy for my daughter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. We appreciate that. Um, so seeing that that was the last comment, is there any other questions or comments from the school committee before we make a motion? Melissa, go ahead. I just have a clarification, just um, to understand a little bit about what the commissioner has put out for us, because we were under a, a mandate before around the masking piece, and it is, it's a little bit different for us now to be able to make a local decision around that. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to clarify that, um, that there was, we didn't have any wiggle room around things before, mm -hmm. and now we do have an ability to make a local decision. So I, I just a clarification. I guess, I'm yeah. sorry, Melissa. Yeah, no, Melissa, go ahead. I, I guess I, I have a question sort of tied to that because if, because we would be making a motion to change our local process, how does that work? Like, does the motion have to have all these specific things that we might've mentioned? Do we need a policy in place for that? How, logistically, how do we, if we were to vote to lift the mandate, how do we actually do that? Correct, okay, great question. So first, whatever we vote is about lifting the mandate. Part two of that is we will need to then revise our policy. We currently have a policy related to masking. Um, MASC submitted an updated policy. So it would be sort of my understanding or expectation the policy subcommittee would meet and craft um, a new policy for us going forward. And I don't imagine all those things could happen before the 28th. So will we be operating without a policy? So Lori and I briefly had this conversation that ideally the, the um, policy subcommittee can meet before. Okay. Um, and so that we would immediately be able to vote something. But in the, in the interim, um, you know, if we voted to lift it on the 28th, then we would have a policy drafted. And, and Andrea, being on policy, we can speak to that process a little bit more um, in terms of, you know, anticipated turnaround time between the MASC updated policy and being able to bring something to the school committee for a vote. Yeah, and I but, guess, um, I, I think basically um, we would then be asking to um, waive probably the first and second reads um, to um, yeah. condense that time frame to something that would happen more quickly. More important, it, it, it cannot be the, policies, the policies that are written now say in the policy if something changes, if something changes, then this policy changes. Yes, the, the headline on that is whatever the whatever the state mandates are or the town mandates. So you don't really need to rewrite everything in the policy because we just have to edit it. We do have a policy for COVID or mask and all that things. It's written into that policy already. So I don't think we would have to write a new policy. We just have to update, update it. Update it and then mm -hmm. it, no. So we, we do have a policy. Great, thank you. I appreciate that, uh, that clarification, Terry, from the policy perspective. If so, we vote to make this optional mask, 
we also have to have constant updates in case we need to pivot back. Mm -hmm. that's right. yes. Absolutely. I think that's 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 critical. And I, you know, again, Scott and Dr. Parkinson, just the conversation with everybody here, I think has been excellent. And obviously everything we've got from parents, the input, you know, just great. And I think we need to continue to monitor and progress and possibly pivot if we need to. Absolutely agree. And can that be put in motion? Or should that not be? Depends on how we, we word it. We want to be careful yeah. that we don't really box ourselves right. in, yeah. Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it, there's some value of just having a motion related specifically to the masking, and we can sort of follow up with that when we speak to protocols and procedures. Bill, did you have? I, I oh, I'm just motion. trying. Okay, uh, sorry, yeah. Andrea first, and then a motion. I know I'm also to make a okay, you could go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It's fine. Yeah, do you want I to think it's something? just important that your vote tonight. It is a policy in itself, right? It's the specifics around if you want to make anything different in a policy. But whatever you vote tonight goes into effect when you say it goes into effect. Regardless of the regardless policy. Of regardless the of, of policy, a, a formal yeah. policy. That's really helpful. Thank yeah. you. Because yes. I was really struggling with the timeline. The timeline. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. it was really not thoughtful for it to be the 28th because logistically, <laughs> you know, it makes it very hard for us who are trying to do this very thoughtfully and appropriately yeah, um, exactly but you know That's it right. is what it is exactly. like our, the caller said <laughs> um so bill would you like to make a motion yes mm -hmm. I, I would like to make a motion that the masking requirement in the falmouth schools be lifted as of april uh 28th april you said april hey, i'm sorry oh, yeah. I was going to write down you'll have, <laughs> okay, you'll have a lot of february 28th okay you'll have a lot of angry people here february okay 28th. so yes make a motion that mask be lifted as of february 28th is there a second i'll second uh lisa has second. seconds um and roll call vote so like to did you want to oh, have a discussion or or it? okay oh, sorry yes yeah, go ahead okay um so um I was actually going to make a motion that we continue masking in Falmouth Public Schools until March 14th. And what would this gain us? So it would allow us to come back from February break and monitor absences and COVID positive spike that may occur after the return to school and separate that increase from the increase that may happen from unmasking. We should expect that. It would allow for two weeks for the at-home testing program participants to monitor for COVID spread. It would allow the policy subcommittee to write and approve a new face covering policy and vote it at our next school committee meeting on March 8th. It will give the principals time to work through details that go along with dropping this specific mitigation strategy and clearly communicate this to parents. It gets us closer to spring and the option of more outdoor time and increased indoor air circulation. And it sets a date in the very near future that students, staff, and families can plan for. Because to me, it's obvious from the feedback that we've received that people in this town are very passionate uh, and care for the well being of our children. And I think we're very lucky to have that. But I also think we want to do this right. We need to do it right to ensure that the schools stay open and our kids are there and ready to learn. You know, my main goal is to keep kids in school. We need to keep the schools open and giving us just a little bit more time to get all our ducks in a row, I think is a very reasonable compromise. So um, I would vote against lifting it on the 28th, but I'd be very happy to just give an extra two week buffer to deal with some of those things on the return from our February break. Thank you, Andrea. Um, any so, amendment or is that that was just her comment? Discussion, right? That was just yeah, my discussion. discussion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I could amend it. So there is a motion on on the table for February 28th, and it has a second. So we'd have to work through that first um, prior to any other uh, motions. And so we can still continue having that discussion. We can though, still right? continue having that discussion. Because um, I really, I I really appreciate. Andrea, you've had your thoughtfulness on that. But I think after hearing about with Dr. Parkinson, um, that he doesn't see that that would, would be that significant. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we need that extra time. 
And I'm afraid that if we had those two weeks where parents have been ready to unmask on the 28th based on what the governor and commissioner have put, that we might, we might be dealing with some other issues in school of just, I don't know. So I, I'm just, I'm a little, I'm concerned about how that might impact our school for those couple of weeks. Um, but I really, I really do appreciate the thoughtfulness on that because I, I think, I think it's all really true. We want to do this right. Um, I think that we're lucky we're meeting tonight to have this discussion and to have our health experts here and to have all the feedback from parents and staff um, and students. So, um, you know, all of this has been very thoughtful and I am feeling comfortable with the 28th date. Um, not 100% comfortable, right. but I'm feeling more comfortable after going through this process. Thank you, Leah. Uh, Bill. Or yeah, and, and, and I would like to comment on that as well. Um, even though I tried to extend it to April 28th. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was scheduling, oh wow. scheduling things out earlier in April and I just, I just got on a roll. But um, when this first came out, I, I thought the timing was horrible as well. Like, and especially since February vacation is pretty consistent across the state. It's not just a Falmouth thing. Um, and, and my initial thought was, well, what if we just waited one more week um, and give people a chance to get back on vacation and, and, and just one more week? Um, I made sure I looked at the numbers and I was even continually doing that tonight as well, where, where the spikes were in, in, in February and where it coincided and where if, where if any of their spikes were in April, you know, in, in, in conjunction with our breaks and, and, and they, they weren't there, it was very small. And, and I think it was Scott that pointed out earlier that the, 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 really the spike in the spring last year was, was in March. And those things and, and listening to Scott, Dr. Parkinson today, and, and looking at those numbers convinced me that maybe that week isn't necessary. And, and, and that's why um, I can comfortably make that motion tonight to, to lift it on February 28th. Uh, I, I have taken that into consideration. Um, and, and I think we, we probably all have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just didn't see the numbers or didn't hear anything tonight that really convinced me that waiting on that extra week was was going to make um, a, a major difference because I, I also heard the parent comments there were there were some that were asking for that as well and, and that's why I wanted to be diligent about that and look into that but I think February 28th is um, along with Desi is is the way to go. Andrew. I just wanted to add just sort of one more point to this as a, um, a concern from the way the community can look at this, you know, like when, when the, you know, I think all of our science teachers would agree that when you have a lot of variables together, it can look one way. And by not separating those out, everything that we see as an increase in cases after that could be attributed to our unmasking and that could look one way and we won't be able to know the difference and that was one of the, the reasons for doing that so that we could have some confidence that those two things didn't happen at the same time and we have zero idea what caused it and that you know, we can cause some panic mm -hmm. thank you any other questions or, or comments for discussion melissa I have a, a few comments jotted down. Um, I've always said that I'm here for the parents who can't be, that want to be. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about, um, I did some data analyzing today, courtesy of a data analyst I happen to know. And um, based on the emails that we have, we have, we had 127 emails, actually 128 since we've been sitting here, uh, 69 of them to be optional and 39 of them to be removed, 20 of them to be kept. 
that does not include the petition that came out for 414 parents that also asked for either optional or removal. I appreciate the people that want to be here. I appreciate the parents who have emailed us, who have reached out to us on both sides. I think that we've had a lot of excellent, uh, well thought out emails from parents, from teachers, from students, from grandparents, and from community members. I don't think allowing the kids to take the masks off is a magic pill. I don't think it will make everything normal, but I think it's an opportunity to start the process. I trust Dr. Parkinson, not just with my own children, but I made a very conscious decision when it was presented to the school committee a few years ago to have Dr. Parkinson be the district physician. I trust him then, I trust him now. I trusted him for the last 13 and a half years on a personal level. I trust him when he says that the if we were to wait a week, the numbers aren't really going to make a difference because the numbers overall are going down. And even if we had a few over the next um, you know, days after vacation, they would still be going down. Uh, there were a lot of really great emails that were sent and I, had originally thought that I would sort of highlight some of them, but I think that I don't really want to do that. I think that it's up to us, the administration, to set the tone as far as teachers supporting students. If today they want to wear a mask and tomorrow they don't want to wear a mask and at first period they want to have it on and by third period they don't want to do it anymore. I think that we are the adults we represent, we the committee represent our community as a whole, and it's up to us to quell the noise and set the tone. Any other comments? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second, and we'll bring this to a roll call vote. Bill Ryder. Yes. Terry Medeiros. Terry Medeiros, yes. Lisa Hart, yes. Melissa Keefe, yes. Welch, yes. Dorfner, yes. Now. We have yes. And Natalie Canalopoulos, also a yes. So effective February 28th, um, we have lifted the mask mandate for K through 12 students. Um, pre sorry, yeah, yeah, K through 12 for Jesse's yeah. student. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make Can I ask? Yes. Oh, I know it isn't on the agenda. We usually ask for follow ups. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to follow up and I thank a Falmouth High School student named Katie Shanahan who put in a request about bringing back the lunch tables. I we also heard this nice. request yeah. on the communication committee that students want to bring back the lunch tables. And the reason I want to signal her request out is that she gave us data. She investigated schools in the area, their population, how long they've been having the tables. So I think we have to honor her request to look into it and see if we could also bring back the tables. I would like Thank to second you. that. <laughs> I, I thought that her email was fantastic. It was. I know that my kids would love it. I think um, if we're taking these masks off, let these kids have lunch with their friends and let's get back to normal. I also want to say to that, that I also had that on my email list and I'm glad that you, um, Thank you. Yeah. mentioned that Terry. I also wanted to, if we're done talking about the tables thing, I just wanted to mention that um, tomorrow night, uh, One Falmouth has their telethon supporting the 12 Falmouth nonprofits from 6 to 8 p.m. on FCTV. So if you want to support a Falmouth nonprofit, I'm giving them a shameless plug. <laughs> tomorrow night, 6 to 8 p.m. on FCTV. It's going to be super great. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Motion to adjourn. Motion. Do we make one? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'll second. I'll second. Uh, Lisa seconds. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Can't imagine why. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much. You.